Uh, hello, everyone. To those of you who went at uh, our other session just before, we had a small introduction to synthetic aperture radar and also our um, SAR processing package. And uh, I don't want to introduce all of you to SAR right now, but I just want to say that this is a package that we are trying to implement in Julia, um, trying to make it a part of the Julia ecosystem such that you can work fully with uh, SAR images in Julia without any commercial software. Um, and this is very much indeed a work in progress, uh, which we started uh, a few months ago. Uh, we're looking forward to it being you know, further developed. So uh, we're looking forward to you know, ideas and stuff. Um, and on Friday, we will then have a, another session where we'll talk a little bit about the, the SAR processing package and where we see it going in the future. Um, where we also show a little bit more about the package. So, um, yeah, uh, so let's get started. Uh, first up, uh, I hope most of you or all of you have the notebooks and the data that we'll use. If you got, if you used the, um, the USB that was passed on earlier today, you should have everything. Um, so in this USB, there are some notebooks and some hands-on session. If you go to the hands-on session, you would be able to see INSAR coherence estimation where you can find our notebooks. If you don't have that, uh, you can also find it online on, um, if you go to the AirSender's GitHub page, they are hosting the SAR processing package and also the Julia EO. And here you can also find our notebooks. Um, if you if you can't seem to get it work, just raise a hand and uh, Simon will walk around and help you while I, uh, I'm up here presenting. Um, and then, yeah, if you did copy everything from your USB, you will be able to find it in here, as I said, um, in the package. Um, if you only uh, copied the data from the USB, you would ha not have our data. Yeah, that doesn't make a, lot, a whole lot of sense, but that's because our data, our data folder is in the hands-on folder. So therefore you would need to find the data um, somewhere else. And um, you can also, if you don't have it from the USB, you can also download that online. Um, and I will show you briefly where you can do that. So if you go to the notebooks um, and then to our SAR processing package, and you pick another branch that is called, uh, wait, sorry, EO Workshop Presentation. Can you make it yeah, sure, 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 sure. If you go to the EU Workshop Presentation in our SAR processing package, you can like press this link and download the data even. So uh, hopefully all of you can somehow get the data. And then when you, have the data, you should then be able to put it in our data folder. Um, how can I increase the size here? Is that possible? I don't know. Anyhow, uh, so uh, you should have the notebooks and the data in the data folder up here. Command plus. Oh yeah, there you go. Have the data in the data folder and then notebooks there. All right. Uh, again, try to do that while I'm talking a little bit here. Otherwise, raise your hand and Simon will help you. Great. Um, so in this uh, hands-on, we will uh, introduce this SAR processing package. And we'll do it by four different notebooks. Um, the three first notebooks are mainly just introductory to the package. And like you, you can see some SAR images and we look at the ocean, we look at different things that you can see on SAR images. And we try to reduce some of the speckle that uh, Felix mentioned earlier today and find some objects. And these packages, oh, sorry, these three notebooks are mainly introductory. And then after a small break, depending on how much time we have, we'll move on to interferometric SAR uh, which uh, Simon will maybe briefly introduce um, before we, we move on to the notebook. Great. Um, 
Now, uh, if you have opened the notebook, um, the first thing I would like for you to do is actually to scroll down a bit uh, to where you can um, install the package. It's down here. Um, in the first cell, install the package and then let it run while I then talk a bit more and you scroll up in the notebook again. So we're installing the packages. It takes a few minutes if you don't have it. And while you do that, I just scroll up again and continue on talking. Uh, right, I'll just, maybe it's a bit too big now. Great. So uh, first up here, we then have a side image. Um, if you recall Felix's presentation, he did say that you perform this multi-looking of images. This is one of those so-called multi-look images. And the reason why we have it is actually just to show uh, some of the features in these side images. Um, to the left side of the image, you can see that there is a slightly higher, it's slightly higher intensity, like right here compared to the right side of the image. Um, and that is actually due to this radar geometry where the incidence angles play like a big factor in the intensity of your pixels. So you're often doing some sort of processing to like account for this uh, varying incidence angle. We have not done so here just to show you that there is a higher intensity on the left side of the image. Um, yeah, you can also see these dark patches and um, white patches in the ocean. So this is an island near Japan, and this is then all water. And uh, some patches of the water have a high, uh, sorry, lower intensity than others. And this is due to waves and capillary waves and um, other locations also rain cells and other stuff. Uh, with a rough surface from waves, we have a higher intensity. So this is what we can see here. So we can actually say something about the, the wind from these side images as well. We also see the land has higher intensity because it has more, like uh, more, there's more scattering, less specular reflection there. We see some high intensity peaks in the ocean. These are mainly ships. Uh, and I look for those in my work and obviously just looking at a ship like in here is comparatively easy actually. And we'll even find one later. Um, yeah. And um, if we zoom in on a patch of the image, you can see some of these, these effects that Felix, Felix mentioned earlier today. Uh, he mentioned foreshadowing, layover, and all of that that you see from mountains. You can actually see uh, a little bit of it here. And we can also see that there is like a, pe a side of the, of the mountain is, have a much higher intensity. So it's quite easy from this image to see that the, 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 the radar is actually looking from the left to the right because of these effects. Um, and that's also why like radar images is not just regular black and white optical images. Like it has a meaning, all of these things. All right. Um, great. And now to the SAR processing package. Um, so, so as I told you just before, we are trying to make a package that can like um, encapsulates all of the SAR processing in Julia. And we started a, a few months ago and we are working a few hours on it every week. So we are not that far yet, but uh, we are welcoming every co collaborators. And so far we have some, some, how can you say, SAR specific processing steps like the geocoding, the INSA that Simon will talk about later, the sensors. These are, uh, how can you say, specific for SAR images. Um, and this is where we actually spend like most of the time um, working on. And then we have like a few other things like object detector, speckle filters and visualizations. Now, we don't know much about Julia yet. So we, we would like for people to tell us how we can, for instance, do the visualizations better because there's no reason for us to not use Maggie, for instance. So maybe starting uh, from the hackathon, we'll change this package, who knows? Uh, likewise with object detectors, like these are just made to show something. Um, currently we are only, uh, we can only use the Sentinel-1 SAR satellite um, that Felix also introduced. However, in the future, it's quite simple to add others. Oh, simple. <laughs> we can add others like TerraSyx, RadarSat and so on and so forth because um, 
much of the other things like over here are very similar. Um, and the different SAR satellites are actually trying to make the data similar. So he also mentioned a company called ISI. They, their images are built like exact same as Sentinel-1. So we can just add ISI here and everything is the same otherwise. Uh, we are not there yet, but like future. Um, yes, so even though this is what we spend most of the time on developing right now, this is not what people normally use when they use SAR. They use like object detector or speckle filters or something like that. Uh, so it's kind of like, it. this takes the most time to, to implement, but people don't use it a whole lot. We hope that they will do so in the future, but maybe. Um, but it's really interesting what you can do and we'll see so later. Um, yeah. Uh, so let's move on. Hopefully everyone now has the SAR processing package and also using plots. So the first thing we'll now do is to load some, some subsets because these SAR images, they are also like several, several gigabytes each. So we have like a few subsets for you. Um, now here we then see that the, the subsets are indeed complex. So the SAR images have both a real and an imaginary parts of them. And from those you then find images that looks nice. Uh, so you can obviously from them, if you look do like this, we can take the real part and um, the imaginary part obviously, and the face. Not a lot of people use, oh, sorry, angle. Um, not a lot of people use the, the angle of the data, but we will do so in the INSAR part. They are actually just use the, the amplitude of the data. And uh, so will we, in the next three notebooks, we'll just use this amplitude image. Now, this is then what we see right here. Um, it's a flipped amplitude, it's a flipped image uh, compared to like, um, I can say let long, but this is how this is the then the radar geometry. And here images that they're flipped because this is how the set satellite images. Um, we can see some high intensity peaks as well, and all of the other things that we saw on the other image. Great. Um, now then looking a little bit on the image. Um, this was then the amplitude image as I just saw. Now, if we take the square of that, we get the intensity image and that's actually um, exponentially distributed. And that's a nice thing because a lot of the, the applications you do or operations you make on these side images have some like statistics. So you need to know about the statistics of these side images and just a single look complex image as we saw uh, just earlier is is exponentially distributed negatively. Um, we also have these multi-looked images that, yeah? Yes, of course I can. Wait. Yes, wait. Is that enough? Yes, okay. Um, now the amplitude image by itself, this is again the intensity, the amplitude image is then not, wait, uh, not exponentially distributed. In fact, if you look at it, a part of it is really distributed, but there we go. Um, this small subset we have, we have right here is, is, a, is one of those homogeneous uh, areas that Felix also mentioned. Uh, when you just look at it, it doesn't look that homogeneous, but in truth it is because of this speckle noise kind of thing that Felix mentioned. Um, and looking at that, we can see that it actually has a, a gamma distribution, um, which is in some cases rather important. Um, yeah. Now this was then just a brief introduction to the SAR images and how we can load them in the SAR processing package. Uh, there wasn't anything more on this notebook, so let's move on to the next one. It's the one you have up here called Speckle. We move up, we load it again. We load the same images. Mm. 
hopefully. Okay, great. Looking at this again, we see in the in the ocean, we see it's very like this this speckle noise that um, Felix mentioned, and we just saw in the homogeneous areas. Now, um, just to a brief recap, this speckle comes from the different scatterers within this resolution cell. So a SAR image has a certain spatial resolution. Um, the SAR, the Sentinel One satellite has like a resolution of three by 21 meters ish. And within this cell, there are very many individual scatterers that each change the face of this SAR image. Uh, and as we just saw before, it, this is a complex image with a face. Now, if we take the amplitude of that, we can see that these different face contributions are actually changing the, then the intensity of the pixel greatly. Even for two adjacent pixels that are pretty much the same, they can look very, very differently because of this speckle noise. And um, that's pretty annoying. Uh, so we want to like somehow um, estimate the true intent, the true intensity, and reduce the variance of these homogeneous areas where there is speckle. And this we can do by speckle reduction. Uh, one thing that we should note is that speckle is multiplicative, meaning that if you increase the intensity of the, uh, the pixel, you also increase the speckle. And that's quite important in SAR processing uh, and in also in parts of um, classic computer vision things because you can't take the difference of two images due to this nature. Uh, so for instance, if you have a, I don't know, a, a, some filters where you normally take some pixels, plus them, minus them, whatever. You can't do that with SAR images. You need to take the, the, the ratio between them. So you need to know these things when you, when you implement whatever with SAR images. Um, great. So we want to reduce this noise. Um, and we will do that by just taking the mean of a region. That makes sense. If, if we have a big region and they are all the same, we can just take the mean of that region. Again, we have this uh, homogeneous area here that I, we have taken a subset of, and we want to like estimate the despeckled uh, intensities. We do that using the speckle mean filter, which is just taking a, a sliding window and finding the mean value of the sender pixel for that sliding window. And that should then reduce the speckle. Here we have picked a sliding window of nine times nine, and you then see this. And that should then be speckle reduction. Let's let's look at um, look at what this is doing for the intensities. So we can actually see that when we are doing this speckle filtering that is performing some sort of mean filter, we are changing the statistics from the gamma distribution to a Gaussian distribution, where we can easily see, I hope, that we are decreasing the variance. And that is exactly what we wanted. So we can see that somehow it works. Now, this was a 100% homogeneous area that I just showed you. Uh, it doesn't always work like that. Let's take this region again. Um, we want, obviously, the filter to, to do this mean filter, I just showed you here in the homogeneous area, but not, for instance, here at the shore. Um, therefore, we, we implement what is called adaptive filter, similar it, adaptive speckle filter, similar to what Felix introduced, but this is way more simple. So, here we will actually try to implement something that is called a leaf filter that is adapting the, the speckle filtering depending on the homogeneousness of the region. So it's a, if it's a very homogeneous region, we do the exact same mean filter as I just showed you. If it's not homogeneous, you do not perform this filtering. Uh, let's see if it's, it's, it looks any better. Oh, wait. Sorry. Let's just, this is a leaf filter. And um, we can then compare them, obviously. Uh, wait, sorry. Maybe we should just see the mean filter first. Uh -huh. 
So this is just the same mean filter performed on, on the entire image, well, the entire subset of the image. And we can see, yes, it does perform good speckle filtering in the ocean, but not so uh, like here. Um, that's what we, we, we want to like do. So therefore we are implementing another filter uh, that is called a Lee filter. And it's in, instead of implementing the speckle mean filter, we implement the speckle Lee filter. And here we then can see that, yes, it performs the same mean filtering in the ocean, but not so, for instance, in the, in the city or here at the shore where it's very inhomogeneous. And now both of these two filters are very, very simple and we implemented it just to show them for you guys today. But if there are some <coughs> Felix or others who want to implement some other advanced filters in our package, you're more than welcome to do so um, in the hackathon or whatnot. Um, but yeah, that was then speckle filtering. Mm. That's it for this notebook. Um, please, if you have any question or you can't follow along, just, yeah. Um, yeah, I was just, this reminds me of a slightly different problem, but in, in, um, in oceanography, we have data that uh, sample uh, a turbulent field. Huh? We have uh, data sets, satellites that sample a turbulent flow field. Yeah. And so there are regions where there's a lot of noise. Like if you have the Gulf Stream, for example, is typical. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of activity there. And so we have similar problems somehow of filtering um, the smaller scales. Yeah. Uh, but we don't want to obliterate the Gulf Stream. Right? We want to smooth over the big current. And so what we end up doing, and I don't know if this is useful, is using a diffusion based operator which you can make anisotropic. And so if you can, for example, in, in the case of the coastline here, there are very clear directionality to the, to the problem, right? And so to the extent that there would be kind of a, uh, a directionality in the data set, you could maybe do a trick like that, of like yeah. diffusing in one direction, but not in the other. Yes, so, um, yeah, so, so this one is actually, this is just called the leaf filler, simple leaf filler that we showed. There have been um, built upon very many extra Lee fillers, Lee Sigma, Lee whatever else. And one of them is actually making these masks and figuring out what direction should we filter in. And it's kind of doing that. Um, but, but yeah, there are, I mean, I don't even know 5% of all the speckle fillers out there. So it could be that there is something like that. And yes, we want it. So you can also just, if you want to. <laughs> but yeah, for sure. Uh, Otherwise, we'll move on to the next notebook, three object detection. Wait, what time is it? Oh, great. Um, yeah. Again, seeing the exact same image. Um, so I'm working with... Uh, maritime surveillance here on the also ship detection. That is generally also part of object detection. So therefore it, it's pretty neat to find objects at sea. And in, in this notebook, we'll like try to, to implement one of the simplest ways to find objects in these SAR images. Um, and that could, for instance, be that we have the same image here. We want to extract this little patch we have right here to determine, is this a ship or is it something completely else? Uh, in this notebook, we won't classify it, but we'll extract this exact patch right here. Um, obviously, it's uh, the object detection that we use right now is kind of redundant in this day and age with deep learning where you're using those to find them, but somehow you need to make the data set. And I've used the, kind of like this method to make the data set for deep learning. So this is still pretty neat and good. Anyways, uh, we'll... Um, we'll use um, a method called constant false alarm rate, abbreviated as CIFAR. And what we do here is actually just to, we are, we are comparing the statistics of a region that we are interested in, region of interest, and we are comparing it with the statistics of some kind of cluttering 
a background ring or call it whatever you want to. And if um, the intensity of this region of interest is much, much higher than this clutter ring that we are looking at, we are saying, yeah, there is an object there. We're not saying which object, we're just saying there is something there. And then you can obviously vary the size of both the clutter ring, the region of interest, and the guard ring that you are using to make sure that these things are not overlapping. Um, yeah, uh, and then if we move down a bit, we can, um, we then have it here where we have like a target pixel. We have, a, we have the target pixel that we're looking at uh, and we are comparing it to the mean of the, the background ring plus the variation multiplied by this T, which is then defining the threshold. I don't want to go into much detail about that, but it's pretty much just to find a threshold. If the intensity is higher than that, it's an object. So we are defining the sizes of these different parameters. Um, and then we're trying to implement it on our image. Um, let's see what's going on. Okay, so we have found a bunch of different objects. Now we have a lot of uh, noise mid-C, uh, as you can see. And then we have a lot of objects on land, which we obviously expect because there's a lot of man-made and uh, different types of objects. Uh, and then we can see two, maybe let's zoom in a bit. No, it didn't work, okay. Okay, well, right here, we can see two like very high intensity peaks, which are a bit you know, higher than these. And these then correspond to the two objects that we, found, that we could clearly see in the original image. But also we see that like, there's a lot of objects here. So there are obviously better ways. And a simple one is just to perform some quick and dirty operations. And uh, one of these is another, another type of CIFAR called um, convolution and pooling CIFAR. Uh, honestly, it's, it's not that this is the best, it's just um, something I took from an article. That we took from an article where we're just trying to find some edges uh, first and taking the average and then performing some morphological uh, operations to see what we can do. Um, let's see what results we get. Now this looks much neater, much nicer. Uh, we still have all the objects on land, which is expected using this method on land. Um, but we can see clearly these two peaks in the ocean and all of the others are gone. We then want to take these objects out and, and look at them and to, you know, for instance, classify them or use them for whatever. Oh yeah, we could, if you want to, you can afterwards try to do the speckle filtering before and see if that reduces the number of these uh, objects in the sea. But otherwise we'll just find these objects um, this function is actually just going in and um, finding the center position of the object. Um, and then we are just plotting the positions of the objects to see, to compare the different, um, the different methods. So here you can see the one with the morphological operations, found objects all of these places. And yeah, the other one found all over. So, so yeah. So now we want to look at these two or extract them and look at them. Well, or at least one of them. We do that by just extracting the index of the, the objects and plotting it. So this is, um, this is then the, the, the object we have found down here. We have a subset of right there, and this is just a random subset. And this we could then use for further analysis if we so wanted to. Um, yeah. I don't know if it was a bit too fast, but um, that was actually it. That was uh, the brief introduction to the package and like a small um, gentle introduction to how you can handle it, yeah. Question down there? Yeah. Can you wait for a mic? Um, I'm looking at subset and subset two. Um, did you have to 
like huh? how like uh these are the two objects that are outside the they are offshore right wait are we are you talking about the the one we extracted or the images on the, the top at the bottom yeah at the bottom uh these are the two objects that are offshore right yeah um how did you know that subset two was index number 50 did you manually check it yeah like this was just um so the one we subset two is just th this is not the for sure this was just a picked one <laughs> Oh, so this is did, this is a random one, oh, and so this was, one I then one. found by finding the one with the uh, that was in the bottom of the picture. So this oh, was okay. not nothing fancy there, actually. Okay. Um, normally, um, what you do instead of doing it like this, if I want to extract images, I would put some auxiliary data on the image, um, and then I would find an object and if it's if it's really close to my auxiliary data i would extract that object instead of doing it like this but okay i see thank you yeah, yeah. i have, a, have another question probably still related to uh, notebook two you where you mentioned that the noise is multiplicative and not additive yeah and uh, and then to reduce the noise you use the mean filter so is this a, a geometric mean where you multiply it in a given window or is this an arithmetic mean where you sum it? So I did not, so it looks a bit. Uh, so, it is, so it is like you, you, you just have a, it's, it's a convolution pretty much you do, where you just take the convolution and take the mean of that entire window. Mm -hmm. um, but when you take the mean, you add things. And I yeah, and you're changing the entire statistics of the image. Uh, <laughs> So that's that's what we showed by you change it to to a a, a, um, a gamma distribution even. Um, Maybe I can also explain that. Yeah. So uh, for for um, for speckle areas, um, the the average metric mean of a, of a, of a homogeneous area, the intensity in the homogeneous area is a. a estimator for the uh, backscatter. So if you want something that converges to the to the backscattering, you should take the the regular mean of the um, the intensities and then then it will converge it should converge to the true backscatter uh, value. Um, yeah, and and a, a co common mistake people sometimes do when they do uh, SAR processing is it's very normal to uh, to do a log transformation before sh uh, visualizing the images, and some people also uh, then you can easily end up trying to apply your speckle filter to the log transformed image, and then it does not converge uh, to the true uh, backscatter value of uh, the homogeneous target. <laughs> But uh, I, I think there's many uh, many articles out there on the on the t statistics of uh, yes. of speckle. Yeah. Uh, I have a question about object detection. Uh, how did you actually define this? Uh, four parameters background window guard window probability for for alarms how to define these parameters trial and error okay uh, so you're just playing with them and uh... Uh, i didn't play much with them uh, okay. because this is this this is a method where it's a genuine trial, trial and error you can use them um if you know that you're specifically you're looking for ships okay let's say uh, the sizes can be picked such that you 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 know like then your guard window should be should, you should ensure that your guard window is large enough for you to be outside of how big a ship could be okay okay for instance yeah. um so if the largest ship is, is a few, some hundred meters long so your guard window should be large enough such that your background window is further away um in a sense but otherwise it's much trial and error, um, and let, th this is not the way that proper object detection should be implemented in SAR. This is this was just to show that you could do object detection. Um, but yeah, thanks. thanks. Unless if you know something specifically about your, the, the the objects you're looking for.
Um, in that case, I'll um, leave the floor for Simon. Yeah, so um, I'm here to, uh, to go uh, through uh, Notebook 4. And, uh, and not Notebook 4 is about the uh, INSA. And, uh, and um, just, just briefly to recap what INSA is, it is that if you have two side images over the same uh, location, taken from like approximately the same, same uh, angle, uh, then you can uh, derive information from the face so uh, actually, um, Christian showed earlier, I just step um, a little bit through this. There's some helpful function to load all the, the data. Um, yeah, so um, Christian talked about earlier that um, um, the image, the pixel values are complex. And for most use cases, uh, actually, the the side images you download from the providers are not complex. You download already pre-processed uh, images that have been uh, uh, multi-looked a bit, uh, like combined a bit, and uh, converted into intensities because that's that's what you're after for most purposes. Uh, but when you uh, want to do inside, you're combining uh, uh, two or more images and looking at the face difference. And to do that, you need the original images. Um, yeah, and here uh, we have a, taken a test image over a location in the, in the US. I think it's near Boulder, Colorado. Um, and actually, just to say again that we're working with, um, is, this is a single look complex data. Um, from uh, the Sentinel-1 satellite, and it has some uh, features. For example, here, when I'm showing the image, I'm only uh, picking every fourth pixel in the, the range direction. And it's because when you work with these uh, raw data, the, um, the resolution is four times better in the range than it is in the other direction. Um, but to visualize it, it, it makes much more sense to look at a a, a picture where the the pixels are more square shaped because yeah if 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 you don't have it 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 just stretches out um the image so uh, there's several different uh, steps in uh, computing this uh, complex coherence which uh, i will try to step through and uh, yeah some of it is to illustrate like what is the pro process and what's actually needed and um, it's it's based on a, on some Julius scripts uh, that have uh, that I made earlier together with uh, with Ikel, um for um, for computing this uh, in Fairgram and a complex coherence in SAR. But um, we're now uh, with SAR processing trying to turn it into a package. It's uh, it's far from done, so uh, we think there's a bug somewhere in here. So the, actually the result in the end is probably not exactly correct, but uh, we hope to, uh, to like get this, uh, we believe we can find this bug in a, um, soon and, uh, and then also um, to, uh, to clean up the, the library and, and wrap up some of these uh, steps in, a, in more accessible methods. Uh, and, and have a, a nice API because um, yeah, right now there's, there's not like one method that you just call on two images and then you get the complex uh, infogram. Yeah, so here we have the image. I think it's always good to just briefly what we see on the image. I won't go hard, uh, but here we have some uh, really bright areas and some dark areas. That's the shortening. So that's often uh, some uh, mountains or some hills. At least that's a lot of uh, topography. And uh, over here, we could also have something that could look like topography. Here we have some straight lines, which are really dark. Uh, when you have uh, straight lines that's dark, it's either, often either uh, tarmac or channels. But looking at like how this is oriented, uh, this is an airstrip, an airport. 
So it's, I think it's three runways. And uh, here we probably have what could be some sort of a small city. And um, this, I think, is some circular fields or some circular uh, tanks. It's definitely something circular. <laughs> um, yeah. So the, the first step uh, to make, the hard step to make in SAR coherence is to take two, two images and then uh, place the resample of the pixels so they are exactly on top of each, uh, each other uh, while conserving the spectral properties of uh, each image to then actually compute the uh, inferogram and the coherence. So computing the inferogram and coherence is quite easy after that. Um, and to do that, uh, we first actually need to have some information about the satellite orbit. So uh, the first step here is to, uh, to load a, a file uh, containing uh, the orbit, which is uh, recomputed a while after the satellite has flown to get like the, the precise um, position and location. So this is just a time, and then we have a posi position in X, Y, Z of the satellite and a velocity. Um, we need to be able to uh, find the position of the satellite for all the time in the, the image to, uh, to geocode these pixels. So therefore we need to, uh, to make an interpolator. Um, the interpolator is not so fancy. It's actually just a, a polynomial based. I think it's a fourth degree polynomial. And um, yeah, I just visualized the uh, um, velocity of the satellite uh, uh, during the time it takes the image. As, and as you can see, because um, the time frame it takes for it to take, uh, take this image, uh, is so short, then the velocity only uh, in the set direction, it only varies slightly. And this is actually uh, how it varies across the entire image and not just uh, the subset. So the interpolation doesn't look so advanced. It, it, uh, uh, yeah, uh, maybe I should also say that this here in this, uh, in this first part, it's, it's just a subset of a larger sentinel one scene so like the way that uh, asa releases pic pictures is um in this folder where there's actually three swats and in uh, which are a file each and in each of these files there's like several bursts so there's a, a part of a, a image and then there's some uh, black pixels to divide it and then there's a uh, another part of the image and these birds overlap which, because of the way that the, the, uh, the satellite retrieves this data. So it's, um, um, yeah, it's, it's a bit hard to keep track of the offsets. And uh, this is also why uh, we probably, probably should uh, try to uh, implement offset arrays for this <laughs> because uh, yeah, there's a lot of indexes to keep track of. But we have the orbit interpolator. And uh, yeah, then I just uh, found uh, the airstrip here, zoomed in on that. Uh, and uh, the position is, yeah, around the uh, index uh, 450 and uh, 6,500. And uh, we can um, uh, use the package to, um, to transform this position in, uh, in the image to coordinate. So uh, this is an important step in, um, in like uh, resampling the pictures and getting them on top of each other. Um, yeah, uh, uh, you need a height to do that for the pixels. And I just put in a guess of 10 meters, which is not right, but um, it, it's right enough to, uh, to show the example. Because um, then if you uh, take these coordinates and uh, uh, open this link, uh, 
Uh, then uh, you should come to um, to the actually to the site if the internet is working. Yeah. So we see it 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 it, it fits with it being an uh, an airport of some of near. Uh, uh, and this is probably the city we can see on top of the image because uh, the views are flipped. To the geometry, and we also have some circular fields here. But um, the thing is, I don't know when this image is maybe from 2000. And is it from this year? No, oh, I don't know what I'm. I know that the Sentinel One image is a, it's not a new one. So we have an image from uh, 19. Um, so it can be that there have been some differences, but there's still an airport, so uh, so far so good. Uh, and it, it, I, I should also say we have chosen the, this area because uh, around this area, uh, uh, there should happen an earthquake uh, between, I, I, in the test data we have, in the example data we have uh, four images, and there should have an earthquake either between image two and three or three and four, but uh, we haven't really gotten around to, uh, to visualize that yet. So uh, I don't know if, uh, if you're able to see it or if it's in this subset that we cropped up. Um, yeah, so we have the airstrip. Um, and maybe just to say like a little bit what is happening under the hood to find this position. It's actually a, a system of three uh, equation that is uh, solved iteratively uh, to find the, the solution. And, and the equation is just that the um, distant, yeah, so first of all, the, each index in the satellite, it can be transformed into a, a time, an estimate time, like a time in the flight of the satellite, and then also into a time delay of the signal using uh, some metadata and the, the time, the delay of the signal corresponds to range. So you, uh, you get the, uh, when the satellite uh, were flying over this pixel and you also get uh, how far away the pixel is. And then it's just uh, a system of uh, equation that you have to solve with uh, an initial guess. And it is that the line of sight should be perpendicular to the velocity. So it looks straight to the side of the satellite. Uh, the distance to the, uh, the point on the ground should match the, the range uh, position in the, in the image. And the point should be at the height above the reference ellipsoid. You solve these equa equations, you, uh, you get the, the latitude and, and longitude of the point. Um, and we can also go the other way, where you have the coordinates of uh, on ground, and then you transform it into the psi image. And um, here, uh, it is uh, it works by uh, um, you first give it uh, an initial guess of uh, the satellite position, maybe just in the middle of the image, and then you can um, compute the uh, um, the different uh, the line of sight from the satellite to the to the point on the ground, and uh, you can compute the angle between the line of the sight and the velocity of uh, of the um, the satellite. This tells you if the point is ahead of the satellite or is behind of the satellite. And what you do is uh, based on this information, you make a new guess in time. And uh, you continue this until it converges and you have uh, the time that the satellite were per per flying perpendicular to the point. And uh, when you have that, um, it's, um, the range is simply just uh, to, um, to take the distance to the point. Um, in this example with like converting back and forth, I just make a rough guess of the height that is not good enough when you're doing INSA and you need to co-register these images. You need to have a, 
uh, either you need to have three images and then you can do some trick where you derive the height and get the coherence or you uh, get a digital elevation model. Um, it could also be uh, kind of nice to implement uh, use uh, Rasus to JL or another high level package to handle some of this uh, digital elevation model. But here um, I have a digital elevation model um, covering the area plus much more. Um, actually, I don't, I'm not completely sure where in the digital elevation model the area is. But we can um, get the coordinates for the um, digital elevation model. And then just uh, I'll just start by filtering it to only get the ones in the image. And uh, then uh, we can transform it uh, using uh, the same equations as I uh, described before to positions in, uh, in the SAR image. Once we have the positions in the SAR image, I oh, know uh, just to say, so for inside processing and like for processing in general, we don't need to have the heights of all the pixels in the primary image. If we just define a grid in the primary image and get the heights for those points, we can always interpolate it if we need the heights for the other points. Uh, we don't need it for, for all of that. So we just start by uh, defining a grid in, a, in this side image. So this just uh, defines a grid that we'll be using. And then we can interpolate the heights to that grid and uh, show it. And uh, this sat to gray, it's just a wrapper around the um, uh, image of JL gray, uh, gray type where we just, you know, we, uh, we make sure to map the values between zero and one before. Um, we have been using this a little bit instead of heat map because uh, uh, the images to JL, we, we think it just makes uh, pretty images. And that's also something to take away. Um, did I miss running a cell or is it just a bit slow? Mm -mm -mm. Maybe it's because there's something that needs to be compiled. But um, mm, mm, mm. yeah, so, but in general, we, uh, we do this because we, um, we need to get the, uh, the, the heights of the points. And uh, I can always already start talking a little bit about the, the next step. Once we have the heights of the grid, uh, actually the steps are that we convert the, the grid to latitude and longitude coordinates. And then when we have the grid and latitude longitude coordinates, uh, we can convert it up again to the secondary image. So we have it in secondary image uh, geometry. And then we have the opportunity to resample the secondary image. And uh, so they're stacked completely on top of each other, each other and uh, use it. Okay, so here we have the digital elevation model uh, for the um, grid in the side image. And what we visually can see is that um, it, it looks like it makes a bit sense. We have some mountains here, like some height here, and it's kind of a valley in the middle. And we also have some, uh, some topography in the right side of the image. Yeah. We uh, convert this um, down to latitude longitude. And this actually, uh, yeah, so it, it tells us all the grid points, latitude and longitude and heights. And um, this can be, um, yeah. So first of all, the heights are 10 meters, which is definitely not a good guess for the heights because okay, now it's also, I think it's just one side of the image I did. So at least the elevation here is about a thousand meters. I'm not sure what it is here, but 10 meters is probably not the best guess in the world. But that's also why you use the digital elevation model. It's to get the height. 
um, having this we actually uh, a good way of uh, uh, we would be able to now um, uh, resample the star image uh, to a um, coordinate grid, a regular coordinate grid with latitude and longitude, um, and uh, work with it in nice packages like uh, rasters.jl. And uh, this is very tempting, but uh, for INSAR purposes, this is not good because um, it, it introduces an extra error if you uh, convert, resample both images to a latitude and longitude grid and compare them there. It's better to uh, just resample one, one of the images to the first image's SAR geometry. So, uh, so for now, we just keep the points. Yeah. So now we are uh, here getting to the second um, or maybe do you have any uh, maybe you have some questions but do you want to ask any questions now before we continue with how we handle the second image okay then we just continue and then if you have some uh, questions you can also ask them uh, in the end because maybe it will make a bit more sense when you see some of it so uh, the second image uh, is loaded yeah, I've cheated a little bit and uh, visually found the first and the second image that kind of overlaps. Um, and, and here you can see like actually, so uh, the secondary image is a little bit larger, uh, just the way I selected it. So it also has the beginning of the next burst in it. Um, the reason why we only gave you like a subset is like if you take uh, the entire images of um, of the the four uh, subsets we provided in the in the data folder, they fill uh, 32 gigabytes, and and we didn't want to pass 32 gigabytes around on the USB, so uh, so that's why we made uh, the subsets. Um, but yeah, here we have the second image. We can see it kind of uh, looks similar. To, uh, to get the grid in the second image, we also need to uh, create an orbit interpolator for that. So it's the same procedure. And uh, now we can tr transform the grid from uh, the first image into positions in the second image. Um, yeah, so for example, we have that column, uh, a row, uh, 190 and row uh, column 8080 corresponds to this row and this column uh, in the secondary image. So this is the position in the primary image and this is uh, the uh, position in the secondary image. Uh, now I written a note about um, offsets and this is because uh, this the way this row is implemented, it is that it, um, it, it calculates the row using the time and uh, how, how uh, far the, um, each line, each, uh, each row in the, the SAR image is spaced in, a, in flight time of the satellite. And uh, um, so it doesn't correspond to the actual uh, index if you were to take the entire image index into it. So it, it, it corresponds to the index if the bursts were not overlapping. Um, yeah, so in that sense, uh, there's um, an offset that, um, that needs to be accounted for of, uh, yeah, 503 pixels. Mm, yeah, then um, uh, now we are almost ready to resample the second image, but that's one more step. <laughs> That's always a step more, and uh, not always, but in this case, yes. And this this step is something called deramping, and it's because uh, the way that the Sentinel One image is acquired, it is that the antennas actually uh, scanned a bit during the acquisition. This introduces a phase ramp. We need to remove this phase ramp 
before resampling to not mix up the, the spectra of the data. And then we would have to later on add the, uh, the face ram corresponding to the primary image uh, before comparing them. So first here, we take the secondary image and we remove the face ramp. Um, so it's face ramp. And uh, now we uh, can interpolate it. I, I should maybe say for interpolation that uh, SciPy interpolate is maybe not the best one, but the reason why we just uh, started uh, using it a little bit, it's because we could not find any alternative. The heights, when you interpolate the heights in the first step, the heights are uh, unstructured. Uh, they're not on uh, any kind of grid in the primary uh, SAR image. So we needed to have an interpolator that handled that, and SARPI provides that. But for this, I'm pretty sure that we could use uh, Julia interpolate uh, because now we're interpolating on uh, uh, data from regular grids. So um, we find all the positions, all the positions that uh, we need um, the, uh, the image in the second data from, and we create uh, you know, yeah, the secondary image and we create an interpolator. And uh, now we're ready to interpolate it. This takes a little bit, so just put it to run. But uh, what we do is that we just Resample the secondary image, so right on top of the first image. And uh, now I can also talk a little bit about something I forgot to talk about earlier, or like did, did, just didn't mention. Again, uh, most of the time you would not get the complex uh, download the complex. Oh, it already resampled. Did it? Fast. Okay, so uh, um, most of the time you wouldn't use uh, the complex uh, images. You would just, if you are interested in the intensity, you just download some more pre-pros to start with. Um, these um, intensity images, they're actually, uh, we, we, don't, uh, we don't calibrate these um, images. So there may be some, um, um, artifacts due to the antenna pattern or due to the, the different sensors. When, when you do the um, inside estimation, you look at a, a local window and then um, you uh, compare the phase difference between the value and for the coherence, you also scale it with the magnitude of the images. So in that sense for creating the inside, the, um, the calibration part, is uh, less important and can actually also introduce uh, additional errors if it's done uh, wrong. But if you were to use this uh, for um, for comparing like backscatter intensities, you would have to uh, to go into the metadata, find the right value, and uh, compute some calibrations. Um, and also even if you wanted to uh, to compare the backscatter values in uh, in these areas with topography, you also needed to do some corrections for that. Uh, just to mention it. Okay, we have the um, resample images, so we can just plot them on top of each other. Each, each other, and here I just map it to uh, red, green, and blue to show it. Um, and we have the secondary image as uh, red and the, the other images as um, green and blue. Um, and you can see there's some structures coming up. I don't know, um, do, do any of you have an idea what you can see on this? Okay. So first of all, we have something, uh, a strong scatter appearing here. So that's quite clearly that in the first image, the primary image, so there was like nothing much here, but then there comes something uh, apparent. Something happens with these fields. So for some reason, these, these three fields were uh, stronger in the first image and then are less in the second image. Uh, and that can 
be either due to um, to some vegetation change or actually some harvest. Um, we have a, a general very bluish color, and that can be due to two things. First of all, it can be due to the missing calibration, because actually right now we're comparing images from two different satellites. So um, we are combined, comparing images from Sentinel A and Sentinel B. Uh, so that's this calibration part. Another explanation could be that uh, it's dry doing the second image, but more moist and, uh, and wet doing the first image. Uh, soil moisture have a large effect on backscatter. So if you have a target that is dry, it will, um, it will uh, give less backscatter than the same target when it's more moist or, or wet. So uh, that, that could be a thing. You, you would have to calibrate the images to be sure if it's the second explanation of the first. Yeah. Okay, uh, now we uh, re-ramp the, uh, the secondary image uh, using the, the, the uh, face ramp of the primary image. In this way, they have a face ramp that matches and we're able to, uh, to compare uh, the, the face. Um, uh, yeah, the, the face part. Ooh, yeah, and we have a part uh, more. So before comparing the face part, there's a part of this um, face range between the images, which we know already and is uh, quite obvious. And that is that uh, between the two acquisitions, the satellite is not positioned exactly at the same point. The satellite uh, doing one acquisition is uh, have a, a slightly different uh, uh, place on the sky than doing the first. And this results in a difference in range, but this is a different in range that we can compute. And we can use this different in range to uh, kind of subtract uh, the phase changes that are due to the movement of the satellite. Because, um, what could be really nice to have left is the phase changes that are due to movements of the ground, not of the satellite, because we know the satellite moves. So, um, so here we can uh, create a synthetic inferogram. So this is uh, synthetically how the um, the, uh, the the phase would change uh, if the only thing that happened was that the same scene was imaged by the, the satellite from the slightly different position. Uh, here we have uh, made our own like a uh, homemade uh, plot color map where the face goes from uh, uh, blue to uh, red. And then we have made an image. And like you can also make these images in black and white, but for some reason, people working with INSA really like, they, they really like these colors. So, uh, so we try to, uh, to make the same colors uh, so it doesn't look too different. Um, yeah. And now we are ready to uh, plot the phase difference. So this is, uh, is the phase difference between the uh, two images. We have the, the primary image and the secondary image we sample, and then we remove the part uh, to, to the flat um, due to the satellite change. And uh, here we get an uh, inferogram out that uh, is probably uh, wrong. I think that uh, we believe there's a bug somewhere in the code that uh, creates this. But uh, let first I will pre pretend it's correct. And then after I will explain why I think it's wrong. So um, uh, what we see here is um, we see that um, uh, some areas, uh, for example, the fields here, they look noisy. And, and that is a good sign because uh, you expect um, areas where the surface uh, is not stable, like the surface structure change between the acquisition to, uh, to create random phase and create noise. So if you have uh, 
these fields where there's a vegetation or there's harvest or something that would uh, destroy uh, the, the signal in the phase difference and create noise. So that's good. Um, the phase difference here would uh, correspond to changes in, uh, in distance from the satellite. So uh, here, uh, you would have that from each of these, you would have that uh, this means that uh, all the scene kind of uh, moved vertically up or down. I don't know. I, I would have to, uh, to, to make a color bar and, and analyze it a little bit more to, to get out. But uh, this would correspond to the whole scene had moved between the two acquisitions. Um, the reason why I think there's a bug here is that all these lines are really, um, they're quite a lot in the, in the range direction. Like, so you have a change here in the flight direction and not so much a change in the other direction. And there's a lot of them. Uh, so it, it, it looks like something really moved. Uh, I think this could be uh, due to a small error in the resampling or in the orbit interpolation because errors in uh, when you, um, yeah, so if you miscalculate the satellite positions a bit or you mess up an index, it can also look like things have shifted in range. Um, so that, that, that could be an explanation, but um, to really, um, uh, I think our our next big step for this is uh, to uh, make this uh, a similar infogram using some commercial software, so we actually know like what what is to be expected of this scene, and then we can go back and and debug this the individual steps to find out like uh, where this uh, slight uh, change occurs. Yeah, and um, so uh, actually. So this is just for individual pixels. Normally when you analyze these um, uh, inferograms and uh, the complex coherence, you, uh, you use a sliding window uh, to get the complex coherence, which is a measure of uh, how stable the surface is between the two acquisitions. So here we have a, a image of, um, of the complex coherence. And, and here we see very clearly that the, uh, these areas here uh, are very unstable. Um, like there's something in the surface that changes, like not a, a constant movement of the pixel, but a, a, a change of the surface within the pixel. Uh, we see that the airport, we don't see the airstrip now because the airstrip is actually quite, quite a stable scatterer. Um, and um, yeah, the face of the complex coherence, it, it, it looks like the plot I showed before just filtered. Um, yeah, so this is, um, is the complex coherence. And it's also, it could be expected if you have a lot of, <laughs> a lot of movement in, in the image, but um, yeah, we will have to analyze it further. So this is uh, it for the notebook, but um, I, I think first of all, I would take questions. And second of all, um, so this is, there's um, four uh, subsets in the, uh, yeah, there's four subsets in the, the data folder, uh, which is provided to you. And um, right now we just uh, made a, a, a uh, the complex coherence between image one and two, uh, but uh, you can do all the combinations of these images and you can also change uh, the ordering um, if you wanted to play around with it. You can also try to, so the grid we did was quite coarse. So if you want to try, you can also try to, uh, to make a, a more fine grid uh, in the geocoding and resampling part to see if that improves something. Um, yeah, so uh, so in in that sense, we uh, 
we have some more data that uh, that that you can play with. Uh, you should know that um, uh, uh, yeah, inside requires a stable surface. So um, uh, the um, the more time difference there is between images, the more you would uh, expect the general coherence to decrease, and the more uh, noise you would have in the uh, in the um, yeah in the inferograms interferograms. Yeah. So uh, any uh, any questions? Question. Yeah. Can you can you um, go back to the the place in the notebook where you um, you're showing the both images, one in green, one in red? Yeah. Okay. So um, about the how to interpret this image, uh, my question is: in the red points, uh, is there something added or is there something missing? Um, so the the red. Uh, let's see. The, re the second image is shown as the red. So here there's something appearing in the second image. And the second, yeah, so there's something Up added. Uplifting, right? Uh, no, so this is, uh, uh, here this is uh, the intensities shown. So this is, uh, is uh, doesn't uh, correlate with ground movement, but with the backscattering. Okay. So this goes from there's nothing scattering the radar light back to there's uh, some structure or something that have appeared okay. that uh, that scatters it back. Okay, so that could be caused like deforestation, for example. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think uh, this is very uh, clear. So I'm, I'm not sure what this is, but, uh, and it's also been a, a, a while since I interpreted the images, but it being so strong, it, it looks, I, I would expect it to be, uh, um, I don't know, it, either it, it's, 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 it's kind of a hard, maybe is it a landslide? It could look like a landslide. I think it's before the earthquake. Uh, but it, 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 it could be something like a landslide, drastically changing how that small part looks from, uh, from one image to another. Because it, it looks it, it's too it, it looks too big to be a, a building that's just put up between the two images or, or some other strong. But it, it's yeah, that's something. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I was just trying to uh, speculate as to what those circles are, and do you think they are water tanks or something like that? I see. It's like, I think it's circular fields. At least on Google Maps, it looks uh, very green. Oh, but I see. Okay. Yeah. So, so that's, they've been... Yeah, I, I think they've been harvested. That could be a, a really good one. Uh, at, at least... Um, the two, uh, three top ones. Uh, it, it looks like they because what, what you have with harvested or grown at different rates, right? The vegetation might grow at different rates. And yeah, but I, I think actually, like a newly harvested surface could be, uh, if it's not too rough, it could scatter a lot of the light away. Um, because the, the thing, if it's due to growth, then it's also like, why is it not happening in these two? Because they have, have quite high, but it, it could be different crops. Yeah, like different crops. I, 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 again, I think uh, Felix is uh, the expert on the uh, classif lane classification. I don't... I think he has a comment. Yeah, it could also happen that um, you have different uh, watering schemes. So it could be that the top fields are watered right before the first image and then drying up and then therefore reducing and backscatter. But I mean, 
it's something that we can only speculate about. Yeah, no, 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 no silly question. I uh, just wanted to confirm if uh, it's already possible to access to Sentinel-1 Sentinel to date one data um, through the Earth Engine data catalog, or do you have to have the images a priori to uh, Yeah, yeah. so for this, spec, we have not uh, made any, uh, any functions to download the data automatically. You have to, uh, that's also uh, uh, quite annoying when you work with it. So right now you have to uh, get the data from uh, the the image from one source. You have to get the recomputed um, um, orbit from another source, and then you also need to have a digital elevation model that covers the area. And uh, you need to find these three things and make sure they overlap. It would be really nice to implement some uh, utility data get live uh, path. That, that could like help ease like downloading some of these data, retrieving like at least something like um, uh, the, the digital elevation model. It could be nice. Just, I think there's some in rasters that. Yeah. So I, I think to implement something like that would, um, it, it will not improve the, the quality of the inferogram in the end. Like if there's an error there, there's still an error, but it would be make the user interface much easier to, to work with. Thank you. Sorry to put you on the spot, Simon, but uh, is there like a roadmap for future development? Something that we can count on using it? some point uh, like so uh, we it's have a present no, right we, we have a presentation <laughs> on the roadmap and uh, and vision on friday so uh, so we will have made a roadmap very soon <laughs> but uh, the, the the first part of the roadmap is to um, to actually uh, is not to like expand the functionality scope like the functionality scope is not so big but uh, the first part is to to get um, some validation data to see if it's correct. And then also just to, uh, to clean up and improve what we have now. And uh, um, like we also like, I don't know if you notice in the notebook, but like none of the functions are exported. So you have to do SAR processing dot for every function. So it, it, it's also because we didn't want to decide which functions to export yet. <laughs> So that's like um, a part of that, but uh, but yeah, there will be a presentation on Friday. We will present more. And, that. and maybe the hackathon later can uh, start that conversation. Yeah. <laughs> um, just a suggestion or comment. Uh, do you know the uh, the package uh, satellite toolbox? This yeah, okay. uh, no, I, I heard about it. So so the thing I I I I of uh, what's your suggestion? Yeah, I was wondering if you really need to interpolate uh, the satellite position. If you cannot, uh, maybe uh, you can compute it actually. Um, yeah, so I, I think actually as I, I showed here. Um, it could be a, a good way to, to validate if it's wrong. But uh, the thing about the pol polynomial interpolation is that it's um, the, the variation in, in the velocity is, um, is not so, uh, it's not so great, uh, no, not so big. And uh, if, you, uh, create, if you interpolate it with a polynomial, you can evaluate it really fast uh, where if, if you need to propagate an orbit state, it may take uh, some more uh, time and some more complexity, uh, complexity. But I think also depending on like what your data source is, like, so I, I, I don't know how ESA makes this data, but I think the precise orbits that we, we download is actually ESA that have some 
uh, precise orbit states and then interpolate, you uh, know, propagate them themselves using an orbit uh, propagator. So th th I think they have done part of that work. So we only have to interpolate, but uh, but it, it definitely could uh, could be a, an idea to try with that. And also, uh, it might be necessary um, if you if you consider uh, data where you uh, where you don't have uh, that many orbit states. So if if if, if you uh, if you get data from another uh, data source or satellite where you just get like a couple of really precise uh, orbit states doing an orbit, uh, then you would have to to propagate it uh, to the to the position to uh, to locate it. Concerning this figure, I have a, I was wondering what is the unit of the vertical axis? Is this uh, it's a uh, yeah meters per second. Yeah, yeah, it, 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 it's, it's meters per second. So the speed of the satellite is around uh, uh, a 7.5 uh, kilo, uh, kilometers per second. So uh, yeah, in, in one second, it, it flies uh, 7.5 uh, kilometers. But that also means that in one millisecond, it flies, uh, yeah, uh, 7.5 meters. And uh, that was actually, um, so to start with uh, in implementing this uh, package, we started by um, converting like the time units uh, using the daytime library and to time differences. But uh, we, we really uh, fast discovered that um, when you're dealing with the speed of light, uh, uh, milliseconds is definitely not good because uh, yeah, that's, that's not the accuracy you want. And, uh, and then I, I think the dates also support some nanoseconds, but in the end, what we actually did was that we, um, uh, uh, when we uh, uh, load the SAR image into an object, we, uh, we give it a, a reference time. Yeah, we give it a reference time. And then we, uh, we use all the time we have in as uh, as uh, floats which represent like seconds because to have the float accuracy and also to be able not to have to um, to round to uh, to integers many seconds there could probably be a, a better way to handle it but uh, this was how we did it in the script so we just started with that but um, like um, to have a good object for the times would also be nice that that both yeah that supports the um, the time ranges you need to to work in when you have a when you're timing a radar pulse. Uh, yeah, just a quick follow up on that. I think I'm not sure it's been mentioned, but um, it's very useful that there's a website called Julia Hub, where you can search for packages, and since they're all registered to the same thing, you can find them, um, especially for you know, when you know what you're looking for. Yeah. If you type satellite, this one will, will did come up for me, and I uh, just meant to mention it for those who are, might have never seen Julia Hub. It's a very useful website. And like if, if someone finds a, a bug like <laughs> and, and suddenly uh, you have a nice infogram with like less printers, please uh, tell us <laughs> because we will be very happy, but otherwise we will try to, to find it ourselves. Yeah, I don't uh, I think this is uh, like you are, you are welcome to continue to play around with the with the package. Are you also um, welcome to? Uh, I think maybe the hackathon you can get the source code and uh, and try to uh, to uh, add some features or wrap some of these things up. Like I mean, there's so much you can do. Uh, there's so much that needs to be done with this package. So that's plenty. Um, but otherwise, we will also still be here. Um, yeah, thank you for for listening. Thank you.